So, thank you very much uh, to be here so early in the morning after such a good night. And I have to entertain you this time about uh, potential runaways. Should this uh, LENR reactors in the future work? There is no doubt about this. So, we can read in the literature that uh, this uh, reaction rate of such reactors is temperature sensitive and uh, it increases when the temperature goes up. And uh, you can also read that uh, you can have, uh, you can use an Arrhenius type law with this power being uh, linked to, 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 to Okay, to an exponential of this uh, factor, this is the activation energy. Remember this activation energy divided by KT. And uh, Ed Storm is not in the room, but we have to think about him because uh, he frequently uses this kind of diagram. You know, he says, uh, well, this is the relationship between the temperature and the power. And if you are in this region like Rossi, it works, but if you are too high, you get a uh, runaway. And uh, these two lines are what he calls the thermal barriers. If you have a large thermal barriers, you know, you need a very high temperature to get little power. And uh, if you have a small thermal barrier, you get a high power for the same temperature difference. But, uh, well, indeed, such diagrams refer to the operation of uh, batch reactors in the chemical industry. If you are familiar in the chemical industry with batch reactors, you find frequently this type of diagram. But all my speech is on the fact that you should not use this type of diagram. Why? This is a batch reactor, you see. Uh, they are largely used for the synthesis of many different chemical products, pharmaceutical products, and so forth. So what it is, this is a metallic vessel, stainless steel, at times glass uh, coated. You load these uh, different reactants, uh, you stir everything, and you control the temperature because you have to do that, and you can heat or cool thanks to a double wall system. Uh, and after that, the products are unloaded once the reaction is complete. Fine. If the reaction is endothermic, this is no problem. You have to heat via steam or hot water uh, around this vessel. But if the reaction is uh, exothermic, you have to cool the system. You have to cool uh, the system uh, in order to control the temperature, because if the temperature goes too high, things may go wrong. So this is controlled by a combination of wall cooling, stirring, to a, and the stirring is an important feature to, inc to increase the thermal, uh, the heat exchange between this wall and this uh, chemical load, uh, or, or charge, as we call it. So you see again the same diagram. And uh, the temperature must be maintained below a point of uh, so-called non-return uh, at any time. And this is the cooling power. If, this, uh, if you have this uh, liquid uh, temperature going up, you have to remove this heat. And this is the reaction power, you know, the chemical reaction power. And if you go above this point, I'll show you what happens. So how to start the reaction, you know? You have at first the initial temperature, and uh, in most cases, uh, the reactants don't start to react at room temperature. So uh, if you do nothing, you know, as long as the temperature is low, the reaction is no reason to start. Huh? And to get things happen, you have to tease the dragon stay. Huh? Otherwise, uh, nothing happens. Huh? So if you do so, to do that, you reheat the system by applying, uh, instead of water cooling, a heating by hot water or steam. And as you can see here at the beginning, you have negative cooling. It means heating, so it heats up. If When it heats up, uh, the temperature goes up in the power as well. So now you recognize that if you do nothing, your uh, reaction 
uh, heat release exceeds the cooling rate. So you have to do something. And uh, to do that, you have to tame the dragon, you know, with uh, cooling water. And to do that, you uh, decrease this uh, water temperature on the wall to maintain this temperature. So, fine. Now you have this uh, so-called operating point, but I draw your attention as well on the fact that the water you use is cold. So you remove the heat, but by cold water, so all the heat you produce is spent at a low temperature, you know, it's, it's lost, basically. Stupid. And if the temperature goes above the operating point, you know, things may go wrong, and this is out of control. This is what we call a runaway. <laughs> so why do, what don't you get a runaway any time? Because, you know, this diagram uh, is not, does not tell the complete story. Thanks God, there are other things like the thermal inertia. So, the, for example, uh, for, during the synthesis of uh, the polymerization of polystyrene, you load the polystyrene, the styrene in this reactor, some uh, catalyst, but it does not start. You have to heat a bit, and when it starts, uh, up, the temperature goes up. But if you do things uh, correctly, it does not go up to the point that the styrene, you know, starts to boil because, you know, the reaction exhaust all the reactants before. So, in other words, you are exhausting the dragon because, before it kills you. Eh? Another way to do it, this is for the synthesis of uh, nitroglycerin, you know what it is, eh? ask Nobel, if you are interested in Nobel prices. <laughs> so, added acid is uh, added slowly to the charge, and uh, the reaction starts above 22 degrees C, but by law, at least in France, you have to maintain the temperature below 30 degrees because you never know. Mm? So you add uh, this acid progressively. In other words, you are feeding the dragon uh, slowly. But this is not the only way to do it, and there are other ways to, to control the thermal power. And what I am saying here is that it's much better to use a very high heat exchange coefficient like this. In this case, you have a high uh, uh, heat power for a low delta T between this uh, reactant uh, load and the cooling fluid. And if this is the heating power, the the cooling uh, power is H, H being this heat exchange coefficient times delta T. This is the operating point now. And interestingly, now you can see that the heat is recovered at a high temperature. And maybe you can do something with this heat. In terms of stability, this is important. Uh, let's take the example when this, the derivative of this uh, reaction power dp over dt exceeds the heat exchange coefficient, you know? If you are just below the operating point, uh, the temperature is lost and the reaction uh, extends itself. If it is above, you know the story already, this is a runaway, okay. So in other words, in this case, you have an instable situation. If your uh, derivative is lower than this uh, heat exchange coefficient, this is completely different. If you are too low in temperature, heat heats up by itself up to the operating point. And if the temperature is too high, you know, the cooling exceeds the reaction power and it cools down back to the operating point. And uh, in other words, this is stable. So there is a criteria to get a stable operation this uh, heat exchange coefficient must exceed this power, uh, uh, the power derivative, uh, power tangent angle. 
But there are some differences between LENR reactors and uh, batch chemical reactors. Hopefully, this uh, reaction is continuous. It has to be. The thermal inertia in a uh, continuous reactor is cannot help, maybe during transient phases, but that's all. The activation energy, according to Storm and others, might be high, so the temperature sensitivity must be large. And heat is preferably recovered at a high temperature, hmm? if we want to convert it to a useful energy. So, in other words, the reference to the thermal behavior of batch reactor is inappropriate. You know, we have to, to fall uh, to to forward the message to head the storms and others. Continuous reactors, if we go back to the chemical industry, they are well known for, uh, for example, the synthesis of Fischer-Tropsch process, but there are many, many, many. But anyway, in such reactors, uh, to make in a long story short, you take a CO with uh, hydrogen of uh, the conventional uh, catalyst, and you get alkanes and H2O. It's quite exothermic, this reaction. And you get a blend of hydrocarbons going from methane to gasoline, distillate, waxes, you know. And this uh, proportion depends on the catalyst, but also on the temperature. The higher the temperature, the shorter this uh, carbon chain. And you, want, you prefer probably gasoline or diesel uh, fuel instead of uh, methane or uh, propane. So we have to control the temperature. And, uh, okay, this is what I said. How is it done, for example, in a multi-tube reactor? You have such a large reactor producing, I don't remember how many barrels a day, but this one contains uh, 2,000 tubes with a diameter of 50 millimeters, you know, in this specific case, to have a high heat transfer capability and to heat up the thing, because again, the reaction is to start, so you inject steam, and after, once it starts, you have to remove the heat, and you reheat the steam. And by the way, you use the steam. In a fissure trap plant, the steam is part of the economical balance, you know, to produce power. And you see, for example, here, this uh, cooling tube <coughs> and, and uh, the bed of uh, catalyst where the reaction takes place. So you can already think that uh, this, uh, this could be the Yelianar catalyst, you know, with hydrogen here, and a cooling fluid uh, in, the, in these cooling tubes. In some cases now, it's very much sufficient to use uh, micro-channel technology to have a very high heat exchange coefficient. So if you have a very high LENR reaction rate, you may, you may have to use this kind of uh, multi-channel reactors. Multi-tube design, this is something known already in the nuclear industry, isn't it? Because this is here a fuel assembly for a PWR reactor. And the multi-tube is used to have a very high heat exchange, an efficient heat transfer to limit the surface temperature of the tubes and to avoid water splitting. If you want to know why, please refer to my presentation Tuesday afternoon. So the potential design of alien R system, if they are temperature uh, sensitive, they can be controlled by the cooling fluid, heating and cooling temperature. Additional control obviously is possible, you know, uh, via pre gas pressure, electrical excitation, and so forth, of course. You should not forget that. But in any case, a high heat exchange design is compulsory. So let's take the example of such cells. In this case, you have a stack of plate uh, cells, like Rossi presented in his patent uh, a few years ago now. Or, uh, an array of tubular cells like this. And what is the condition for stability? If this uh, specific power in this plate or in this tube is uh, W, where the activation is energy is E, and the heat exchange coefficient between the surface and the cooling fluid is H, then this is stable if H exceeds this uh, criteria, you know, heat WT divided by K, T squared, T being, in this case, the 
of thickness of the plate or R being obviously the radius of this cylindrical cell. So in other words, it is possible for engineers to design stable reactors provided you tell them what is your specific power and the required operating temperature. So it could be something like this, with, with a liquid flow, you know, you have just your liquid flowing between the cells. If this is uh, so high in temperature that you cannot think about uh, water cooling, contrary to nuclear power plants, for example, you have to rely on gas cooling uh, in uh, gas turbines or uh, aviation engines. We know how to manage gas, uh, gas flow to have a uniform temperature. Last part of my speech is to how, how to improve the COP. You know, I heard so many times that the COP is low, 1.1, 1.2. Oh, it's not very efficient. It's a shame. But I don't think so. Because you are all of us talking about small reactors, and small reactors have high uh, low volume to surface ratio. And it gives you high heat losses, you know. And look at this poor animal, uh, it's cooling down in this uh, uh, demanding climate. So when there is a blizzard, you know, and a very cold wind blowing at an incredible speed, they flock together to, to stay one, uh, all the, uh, body to body to avoid high heat losses. So if, in other words, if you have a COP of 1.1, 1.2 with just the tubular cells like this, don't be afraid. I know how to make a very high COP with your, with exactly the same reactor. You just have to make an array of many, a cluster of many cells uh, put together to decrease the heat losses, you know. So please uh, don't refer anymore to this kind of diagram because they are not relevant for our problem. And I thank you for your attention. A thermal equilibrium situation when the uh, uh, Arrhenius law e exists. Okay, but uh, if we have non-equilibrium situation in a linear uh, uh, process, for example, with a plasma uh, stimulation, it's non-equilibrium. Absolutely. Uh, how can, change your results absolutely. in this case? In this case, the engineer can nothing for you. Sorry. Go ahead. Your conclusion about improving the uh, overall COP by clustering your penguins together is um, valid if the driving force is heat. But if, if the driving force is electricity or something more precious, then you can't help us, um, at least not by this method. If it, is, if it is the pressure, I have no difficulty to imagine a pressurized vessel here. And now if it is electricity, I have no difficulty putting an electrical wiring uh, to energize each of these cells. Now this is valid only if the temperature is an important factor. If the temperature is not, uh, okay, this, is, this speech is useless, but if the temperature is important, well, you, you will have to control these uh, heat losses. And by the way, here, look, there, is, there are electrical heaters. In this case, not anymore, because indeed, in this image, there is a cooling, there is a fluid going through that, and this fluid can be preheated with natural gas or electrically, whatever you want, to reach the operating temperature. And once you reach the operating temperature, this cooling fluid now you don't reheat anymore. You, you use it as a coolant and to extract the heat and to use this heat. No, I agree with you. And, and um, we are going to have to run our reactors at elevated temperatures, whether they want to be run there or not, because that is how we're going to make use of this uh, heat produced. Um, but I'm just pointing out that there are two components of the input power. One is the 
thermal input, which is addressed by this concern, uh, there are not. There may very well be non-thermal inputs that don't scale in the same way. This is uh, what I discussed in Avignon, by the way, uh, with a complete, more complete uh, scheme of the overall reactor, including this electrical energy uh, input required to operate it, and uh, discussing the importance of the COP, uh, the thermal, uh, the heat, uh, the temperature efficiency of the Carnot engine you use to it, and the necessary energy extracted to keep it running. So if you refer to my paper in Avignon, you will find this exactly. Thank you. Uh, 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 you know that uh, uh, today uh, 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 there is absent uh, uh, knowledge about scaling laws of the linear uh, physics. Uh, uh, so um, you uh, have a cluster of the uh, this tube, but. Uh, uh, scaling uh, of a single tube and uh, many tubes may be uh, absolutely different COEP because of uh, active particles for the linear uh, process uh, uh, is uh, many uh, in this case and the single tube uh, absolutely a different number. Yeah, 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 no, I disagree completely on that. If you give me one cell, like a Nissan cell, by the way, producing some power at a given temperature, I know, as an engineer, how to take hundreds of these similar cells. This is not a scaling problem in, in the size of the cell. I'm scaling by multiplying the number of identical cells. In this case, uh, this is no problem. No, the, the, the uh, fire from the uh, 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 small fire and large fire, that's absolutely different uh, this is why physical would, process. This is why I would re be reluctant to increase the diameter of one cell, exactly f f because of that. It's a, it's a technical uh, reaction uh, depends on the radical and uh, active particles. Yes, yes, yes. The losses of these particles are absolutely different than the uh, uh, large region, uh, uh, reaction region, and small reaction. Lost, absolutely different. I agree. This is again the reason why I tell you if you give me one cell, I don't want to change anything in this particular cell. If it works, I keep it as it is. I don't want to change that anything in it. I keep it the same. I just put 10 or 100 of 1,000 together. But each of them will behave exactly as if they were individual cells, not more. Now, if you increase the size of the cell, we have to go back to the process conditions and to study again what, it, what happens if you change this, uh, the size, for example, or the gas pressure, or the size of the particles, or whatever you want. But uh, the engineer, uh, you know, I was in an engineering company and I, I, uh, I made many different plants in my lifetime, going from urea producing plant to uh, whatever you want, uh, including steel making plants and so forth. And we never knew all the processes from the clients. But the clients had to tell us the process book stating if you do this, like this, and like that, it works like this. Now, okay, fine, with that, this is pure engineering. Now, if you change the size of the cell, well, this is not more engineering. You have to go back to the process. You, you, you did the calculation for the runaway. What about in the case where you are um, a Gaussian, Gaussian type of curve and not an exponential curve? Where will be the operating point then? But uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, what is the question? Suppose the curve, instead of being exponential, yes, you have a, a, a curve with a maximum, then goes down with temperature. 
the COP goes down. Ah, if you have a curve like this? Yeah. It's stable by itself. It's stable by itself. Yes, if you are on the, yes, uh, you have the same criteria, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, let's say, uh, oh, come on, let's say, the angle of this uh, line exceeds the tangent, you know, of your power curve, so it, it's the same. It's, I think you've already answered this, but just to check it, um, when Missouri replicated uh, or attempted to replicate Chelani, they, they wire, wrapped the wire on a ceramic helix and it provided no non-linearity in the heating of the wire and it, it, in my understanding that's why it didn't function and ours seemed to do. Um, what you're saying is essentially the Chelani cell would have to be it's in, in, in its entirety with enough airflow around the outside in its functioning form and then rather than being compact it would actually be a large replication or, or matrix. Yeah. That's all. You got it. Okay, so it was the last question and uh, now it's Philippe uh, to, to come. Thank you. Thank you very much.